So um, this is the speaker workshop. Um, this is the first part. We're going to go through um, selecting a topic. The next part, we're going to work on actually fleshing out our, our abstract, our outline of our talk. And then in the third part, we'll give some tips and tricks for being a better speaker, managing nerves, and um, creating better slides. So I am Alana Burke. My pronouns are she and her. I work at Amazee.io doing documentation, training, and developer advocacy. I'm also on the leadership team of Drupal Diversity and Inclusion, and I help liaise between the Drupal Diversity and Inclusion team and the um, community working group, the CWG. You can find me on Twitter and Drupal.org at aberk626 or in the Drupal Slack and most other Slacks as Alana Burke. Oh, and also land acknowledgement. I live outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on Lenny and Lenape lands. Uh, so code of conduct, all attendees, of course, are expected to abide by the Midcamp code of conduct, which you can find on their website. Um, any issues, um, there is an uh, email address, coc at midcamp.org, or you can contact um, Amy June or Andrew Olson. Um, I have also had the COC training um, if you feel more comfortable reporting something to me. So let's talk about if you haven't spoken at an event, why not? What are the things that you're worried about? If you haven't talked at a meetup or a local Drupal event, Drupal Camp, Drupal Con, why not? Have you ever submitted a session? Um, are you just worried about getting rejected? Are you nervous? Is it the public speaking? Think about why you haven't tried it yet. And if you only talked once or something, why didn't you do it again? Did you have a bad experience? Did you get bad feedback? Um, it helps to think about why you haven't done something um, to figure out why you should go forward and do it. But there's a lot of really good reasons to speak. And here's a few of them. You it helps you be seen as an authority in your field. If you speak about something, suddenly everybody thinks you're the expert on it. It helps you share your knowledge with others and give back. It builds your confidence. Once you start speaking about something and other people think that you're an authority on it, you start to feel that. It helps you get over imposter syndrome. It helps you to meet people and be part of the community. Uh, at some point in the past and again in the future, it lets you travel. Uh, I've gotten to go to places that I never would have gone to um, because I was going to events. And of course you go to conferences where you get to learn other things because you listen to other people. Uh, it's fun. I, I like presenting and giving sessions and getting to talk to people and help people and teach people you get a, it's rewarding. You get a feeling of accomplishment. It's also really career building. If I hadn't started speaking in the Drupal community, I would not have the job and the career that I have now. Absolutely. Um, and it helps you to be a role model for other marginalized and under, underrepresented groups. Um, I originally started giving this talk specifically within like the DDI sphere um, for underrepresented minorities. So, um, you know, we were, encouraging underrepresented folks to speak so that other underrepresented and marginalized groups can see them speaking. So um, it's still always great to be a role model no matter who you are or what group you represent. There are a lot of myths about what we think a speaker is versus what they actually are. Um, everyone has their own reasons for not speaking in public, especially at tech events, but a lot of those reasons are based on myths that we can dispel or concerns that we can address. Myth one, I'm not an expert. That's okay. You don't have to be an expert. Everyone has a different idea of what expert means. No one knows everything and everyone has something to learn you could know more about your topic than your audience knows. You can find a topic where you have knowledge that your audience does not. There are things that you probably do with Drupal or whatever tech you use all the time that other people don't. Something really cool and specific maybe. 
that makes you an expert in their eyes. Even if your audience has knowledge on the same topic, they're not gonna frame that knowledge the same way that you do. So they will still have something to learn from you. It's also possible that you feel like you only know a little bit about the topic, but it's still more than many people in the audience who are happy to learn what you know. And you're probably more of an expert than you think you are. A lot of us, of course, suffer from imposter syndrome. If you don't know, this is the psychological phenomenon where you feel like you're an imposter and you feel like you don't really have the knowledge or the skills to be here, but that you've somehow managed to fool everyone and they're going to find out. Imposter syndrome is really common. You're not alone. I've uh, recently been giving talks on documentation because that's what I do. And uh, I gave one for the first time to a group that um, wasn't a Drupal group. Um, it was a totally different, um, it was a DevOps days talk and I'd never done anything in that community. And I was so nervous because it was like, oh my God, you know, people in Drupal think that I'm like a competent person, but what if these people think like I'm a total loser and like, what am I doing talking about documentation? And I was like, oh, Anna, calm down. Like this, this is literally your job. It's your job title. It's the thing that you do. And of course the talk went fine. Everybody liked it. I taught them lots of things about documentation. Um, but, you know, it's, Imposter syndrome, it happens to everyone. Try not to worry about it. Myth two, this is a big one. People will ask questions I can't answer and I'll look like a fool. Well, people might ask questions you can't answer, but you will not look like a fool. Your audience understands that not everyone knows everything and it can be hard to think on your feet. You know, you're in the zone, you've got your slides, your session, and the audience knows that that's what you're thinking about. They're sympathetic. Many of them have probably talked or they're too nervous to talk. If you don't know the answer, there's a handful of things that you can do. And we're gonna go over them in the third part of the talk um, in depth. But there's so many ways to, to work with this, to say, hey, we'll answer this later. We'll talk about this later. Or um, did someone just, Uh, yeah, everything okay? Oh, sorry, someone, there's audio coming from somewhere else and I'm trying to. Do you have Gather Town open? Yep, okay, sorry, close that. <laughs> it just started coming out of nowhere. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna start all of our sessions with make sure you close Gather Town. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Carry sorry on. about that. Uh, let me go back and find my... Okay, sorry, back to, back to the slides. <laughs> so yeah, there's a lot of ways uh, to get through this when people ask questions that you can't answer. Um, tell them you'll talk to them later. You'll post the answer on your blog um, to talk to you on Twitter. Don't worry about looking like a fool. I'm too nervous to speak. Your audience gets that too. Most of them don't have the bravery to speak because they're not up there. So practice, 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 practice. Practice in front of your pets. Um, my pets could probably pass Acquia certification because I've given so many Drupal talks in front of them. Uh, in front of your family. Uh, my mom could probably do a Drupal site because she's heard so many of my talks. In front of the mirror, record yourself and watch it back. Is that a horrible sounding idea to most people? It is, but you will find all of the things that you did wrong and fix them. The more you practice, the less nervous you'll be. But it's okay to be nervous. Pretty much everybody is. Myth four, I have failed if everyone in the audience isn't totally engaged. Sometimes when you're speaking, you're going to look out at the audience and it will look like everybody is bored. That's okay. Most of them probably aren't as bored as they look. A lot of people have just like resting bored face. Audiences generally sit with pretty neutral faces. So if they're not smiling and nodding and cheering, it doesn't mean they're not engaged. If they're using their phone or tablet or laptop, it doesn't mean they're ignoring you. They could be writing down every word. Um, sometimes if I'm in a really great session, I'm like live tweeting the session. So I might look like I am totally ignoring the speaker, but I'm actually completely into it. And of course, no matter how good a speaker you are or how good of a session it is, 
it's not going to be for everyone. Not everybody's going to be engaged. That's okay. Nobody can connect with everybody. There's probably people who go to Beyonce concerts and are bored. I don't know what's wrong with them, but it happens. Don't take it personally and be happy to connect with the people that you do connect with. Myth five, a talk followed by a Q&A is the only format that I can use to share my knowledge. No, there are plenty of other ways to share your expertise at any event. You can lead a workshop like this, a group discussion, put together a panel. Some events offer the opportunity for lightning talks, which is a great way to get started. Um, I'm pretty sure the first talk I ever gave was a five minute lightning talk at a girl development event. Um, so you just talk for five or 10 minutes and then you're done. It's a great format if you're nervous because you can talk fast and it's over quickly. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to actually finding a topic. This can be really hard, um, but we're gonna go through these exercises and it should help you. So we just talked about how a how-to is not the only talk format out there. It, a lot of talks are the sort of how-to brain dump sessions, like how to make an extension, might be someone walking through how they made it, showing you some code, and then at the end, asking questions. This really isn't always the best or even a good way to impart information. It's just kind of like a lecture. People sometimes walk away feeling overwhelmed or not remembering everything that they learned. There are a lot of other formats that promote better learning. Um, you know, talking about how you learned something can also help other people learn it in a similar way. So here's some other ways to format a talk. A discussion, um, you are a facilitator on the topic and the audience actually discusses it together. Um, a panel, multiple people answer questions on the same topic and they're people that you've already selected. Story-based. So this can be explaining, you know, how you did something and the mistakes you made along the way in a narrative format. A case study, most of us are familiar with these, you know, the story of how you created one thing in particular and how that worked. Um, this is often done um, in conjunction with a client, like presenting a client work. And a workshop like this, a hands-on learning experience where people, uh, well, <laughs> in the uh, in person would bring their laptops and create something as you go. And a talk can also be led by more than one person. Talks with two or three people can be really engaging. And it also gives you a little bit of a backup and a break from speaking. Um, in DDI, we often give a sort of um, panel talk even though uh, we're not really talking amongst ourselves, but it's several of us presenting it. And it's really nice because if one of us forgets something, the other one can hop in. Um, if one of us is <laughs> running out of breath or needs a drink, the other one is always there to, um, you know, to hop in and finish it. So that can be a really nice way if you're a new speaker as well. And it gets more people speaking, which is great. So, all right, we're at, 15 minutes in, which is perfect. So now what we're gonna do, um, we're probably not gonna use 15 minutes for this because we want to get a little more along, but we're gonna brainstorm as many topic ideas as we can in let's say about seven minutes. Um, so we're not looking for perfect or even good ideas. The idea is to just get them out of your head, good, bad, or ugly. See how many you can get, um, absolutely anything that comes to mind. Um, as we go through this, I'm going to, the next couple slides are some ideas, and I will slowly start reading them out loud. Um, so whether you want to type it up or write it down, um, just start putting out ideas. I actually love going through this myself uh, at whenever I give this workshop, and it helps me come up with ideas for the next um, sort of event season. Okay. So let's start brainstorming. What got you into Drupal? What keeps you in the Drupal community? What do you love about the Drupal community?
what do you want to learn next? Think about the first time that you created a custom theme or a custom module or wrote an extension. What has been your biggest challenge in Drupal or work or life in the last year or two? What was the last thing that you learned? How did you learn it? What is the biggest challenge that you have ever had with Drupal? How did you overcome it? If you didn't overcome it, talk about that. What are you most passionate about when it comes to Drupal? What most excites you? I'll leave this slide up for a couple minutes and then I will go on to the next set of ideas. What sorts of things do you love sharing with others about Drupal? What question about Drupal do you get asked about most by clients, friends, and family? Make a list of what you want to learn. A lot of speakers like to have sort of aspirational talks where you put together an abstract and a talk about something that you want to learn. And so if your talk gets accepted, now you have sort of locked yourself into having to learn that thing. What's your favorite module or theme? or thing that makes your life easier in your day-to-day -day job. What's a cool thing you've created? Tell us about it. What are your favorite resources? What are some cool tricks you use all the time? Are you super awesome with the command line? Share those. What could you talk about without slides? And of course, any prompts that we didn't ask here, if you wish we did, if you have any great ideas, um, please feel free to share them in the chat. And I'll give you another minute and then we're gonna work on um, further selecting our topic. This is the tough part about running a virtual workshop because um, I have no idea what any of you are doing. So I hope you're here with me.
So hopefully you now have enough ideas listed to start refining them a little bit. We're going to do some exercises where you pick two topics from your list that you think best fit the following questions. You also might find that you come up with some new topics um, that weren't on your list. So if so, go ahead and write those down. If for some of these you don't come up with any answers, that's totally okay. Just skip it. So for a story-based talk, pick two topics that you don't know a lot about, but you've had some success with. So this could be a story-based talk where you narrate um, you know, how you interacted with these, um, what success you did have, and, you know, how you navigated that. For a how-to presentation, pick two topics that you are confident about and could lead a how-to presentation. So this is your classic sort of lecture. Um, Generally, this might be something related to, you know, this is something that's related to what you're an expert about, probably something related to your job. Um, so my how-to presentations right now are generally documentation related because that's what I do. Panel or discussion. Pick two topics that you may not know much about, but you have some good questions for. So this could be for moderating a panel or leading a discussion. This could also be something that you're interested in, but you know that you don't have the expertise to speak on it, but you wanna find out more about and get more involved in. For a case study, pick two topics that you've successfully worked on that you feel you could do a case study about. So this would be something that you could show that you've done and talk about how you did it and what the results were. For a workshop, pick two topics that you think you could teach to others in a hands-on manner. Um, generally, you want to consider the amount of time this would take, the complexity. Um, so you wanna be careful with workshops and not pick anything that's going to be, you know, too difficult or too hard to set up on someone's computer. But things like, you know, this workshop that is totally platform agnostic is easy to do. Um, but you can also do things that are more targeted, like, you know, setting up, a, you know, PHP storm or, things that, you know, something that you have expertise in that you know other people are interested in um, that you can teach to them. And then pick two subjects in the topic list that you're, are your absolute favorite that you would feel excited to present. And then Look at your list and see up of all of the topics that you've been writing down, is there one that you're especially passionate about? And if so, that's your topic. Um, you do need to pick one to go through the rest of the exercises with. If that doesn't wind up being a session that you wanna propose, that's okay. The exercises are all still super valuable and valid. Um, hopefully, it'll wind up being something that you do want to present. Um, but if not, it, you know, everything that we do here is still going to be valuable. So hopefully, um, you've all got a topic now in mind. And we want to refine it a little bit. Um, so if you say you're talking about um, you know, you want to give a presentation on the media module. Um, so think about, you know, who is the media module for? What does it do? Why was it created? When would you use it? Where would you use it? Um, so think a little bit about, um, you know, the how 
broad of a topic it is, how interested um, you know, various people would be. If it's a topic that's really super niche and you don't think a lot of people um, might be interested in it, it might not be the best thing. Um, but these topics can help you, or these um, questions can help you sort of tease out some of your ideas around your topic and, um, you know, give you a little more, some different ways to think about it and look at it. And it'll also help you when you get to your abstract and your outline. Okay, so we are um, almost at 315. Um, which I think puts us almost at break time for the next part of the workshop. Um, if I'm, I don't know if the other, if the organizers are still on, um, but if anyone has any questions about topics or wants to talk about their topic selection or share their topic, um, let's go ahead and do that. Avi, am I right that we're almost at time for the first part? Yes, I believe I'm fully on schedule. <laughs> uh, yeah, it looks like it is till 2.15. So yeah, okay. right on there. Okay, and does this room just stay here throughout? Like we don't have yes. to leave and come back? Okay. Correct, yeah, so it's it's here. Um, you're welcome, like people are welcome to hang out, um, converse, take a break whatever yep. so if anyone wants to take a break and come back in 17 minutes feel free if you want to talk about your topics or ask any questions um also feel free to do that uh, i'll be here i'm gonna stay throughout this first one so we've got our topic and now we are going to talk about writing our pitch the title and outlining our talk. So whatever motivates you to get started speaking, you first have to get selected. And to do that, you need to create your proposal or your pitch. We're going to use these terms interchangeably. It's also called an abstract. Um, and since your proposal defines the scope of your talk, it can be a good early step in the overall process of developing your talk. Um, once you get started writing um, proposals, or if you get into doing events um, or being on a program um, program team or chairing a program team, and you're reading lots and lots of pitches, you will get a feel for how they tend to flow. I also recommend um, reading the abstracts of an event that you're planning to propose um, a session to. Um, either read the ones that have already been proposed for this year if they publish them or from previous years to get a feel for them. Um, but eventually you will get a feel for like what an abstract, a pitch should kind of, how it should flow. So we're gonna talk about now what makes a good pitch. Here is an example of a good one. The title is Responsify All the Things. In our new web multiverse, it's more important than ever to make your valuable content available to all users, regardless of how they access your site. In this talk, we'll cover how responsive web design came about, the latest responsive web design news and trends, and some basic and not so basic techniques you can use to make your next Drupal theme a responsive one, intended for developers and designers who aren't afraid to get their hands dirty with a little code. So what makes this good? It's got a title that's a little catchy, but it's not too catchy and we understand what it's talking about. Um, they give us a little bit of an intro and then they tell us what they're going to cover and who the talk is for um, developers and designers and that it's going to be a little bit technical because they're going to include code. It's not too short, it's not too long. It tells us a little bit about their scope and um, it's focused. So when you're writing a pitch, you want to tailor it. Consider the tone of your pitch. If you're pitching something to a meetup, it's probably going to be pretty casual. For larger events, it's going to be more businessy. I've also found that larger events often even um, publish 
blogs or articles about how to get accepted into their events. Uh, I was applying to some huge like enterprise DevOps summit and they had all of this stuff about you know, what's a good pitch for this and how to get accepted and what they're looking for and what kind of things to write and what not to write. So for large events, you might find things like that. Um, consider your vocabulary, how technical should it be? You know, if you're proposing a Drupal, uh, a Drupal session to a Drupal event, it's fine to use, you know, Drupal words. <laughs> if you're proposing it somewhere else, you might wanna keep your Drupal lingo, uh, you know, keep it out of that pitch and explain what you're talking about. Um, make sure there's some kind of hook or point of interest to get people to actually want to come to your session. Um, for Drupal, uh, sorry, I should have indented that. Uh, Drupal is pretty playful. Um, so you can, you know, you have a little latitude there. And for everywhere, no political, religious or sexual overtones ever anywhere. Um, I cannot tell you in the last couple of years how many uh, make something great again talks I've seen. Yeah, just don't, just don't ever do that. Don't use a curse word in your talk. Um, I had to, I somehow had to explain this to someone like a year or so ago, even though it was the title of a book that they were going to talk about, but it still wasn't appropriate to have the curse word as the title of the talk. Um, and I feel like I shouldn't have to explain that to adults. Just keep it professional. <laughs> uh, err on the side of caution always when keeping things professional, please. Uh, here are six important points for writing a pitch. Um, and I've got the source here. I will share these slides later. Point number one, direct the proposal to the attendees not the curators. So many conferences, pretty much all of them, use your talk proposal as the description of your talk in the program. So with that in mind, your target reader is actually the conference attendee who is reading the program. So tell the reader why your talk will interest them and what they will learn. The curators want to put together a great conference with compelling talks for their attendees. Your talk will be part of a package they offer, so sell it. Like I said, research the event, read the sessions that have been there before. Are there different tracks? Who's the audience? Is it lots of devs? Is this mostly for users? Is it design heavy? Different conferences have different personalities. Are they short on technical presentations? Light on talks for beginners? Try to fill a need. Um, and this is another thing for people who are beginner speakers or have imposter syndrome. I always find that people are asking for beginner or 101 talks because people tend to want to talk about the things that they're doing right now, which means that there's a lot of intermediate and more advanced talks. But it's hard for beginners <laughs> to find sessions for them when there aren't a lot of beginner or 101 talks. So you might find a lot of success if you propose something like, you know, uh, get 101, that's a get talk I've given, or command line 101, or, you know, writing Drupal modules for beginners. So think about things like that. Be specific about the focus your talk will have. Um, a shallow introduction to many things is not going to be as interesting or as helpful as an in-depth introduction to one thing. If you discuss a broader topic, only do so to set the context for what you're going to focus on. Um, in my work as a conference chair, a lot of the talks that we decline are because they are not focused enough. And it's clear that there's no way that they're going to be able to cover all of the things um, or this entire large topic in the time that they are given. Um, so make sure that you have a very specific focus in your pitch. Pose the question your talk will answer. Often talks ans talks uh, sorry. Often talks answer questions that start with how, why, when, and so on. So an easy trick is to directly ask these questions in your proposal. So you leave the reader wondering the answer, which 
you give during your actual session. So you'll find that a lot of talk titles are actually questions, um, which is a really fantastic way to engage people and get them to, you know, wonder what the answer is and want to come to your talk. So, you know, if we had a, uh, if we gave the panel of WordPress versus Drupal, you know, it would, we could just have a panel talk called WordPress versus Drupal, or we could say, um, when do we use WordPress versus Drupal? Or, you know, when is it right to use WordPress? Or anyway, using that as an example. Make your point as succinctly as you can. This kind of goes back to focus. If your first draft requires more than two paragraphs to get to the point of your topic, narrow that down. Take out any words that can be, be removed without changing the meaning. You may have a lot of competition, so make a good impression quickly. If your proposal is too much work to read or understand, it might get skipped during the selection process. Also consider that it's very likely that someone else will propose the same topic as you, um, especially in a larger event like a DrupalCon. Um, we often wind up narrowing it down to a few things on the same topic and then having to pick the best one. Um, sometimes there are several best ones and it's very hard to make a decision and all we have are the words that you've written. So make your point um, as best you can, keep it focused and clear. Use proper grammar, spelling, and punctuation. If you submit a sloppily written proposal, you appear careless and as if you're not taking the opportunity seriously. You risk being rejected on those grounds outright. Speaking requires a lot of thoughtful preparation and the curators can only assume that you will be as careless when preparing the talk itself. If you're not a native speaker or if writing isn't your strong suit, get someone to read it over for you. Um, you should probably get someone to read it over no matter who you are. Um, I am writing professionally and yet I still get someone else on my team to read mine over anyway. Um, I, I hate turning down talks um, because they were sloppily written. But again, it's sort of insulting when you're doing hours and hours and hours of work preparing an event and someone hasn't even taken the care to edit their proposal. Um, again, if you're not a native speaker, I know that I have read enough talks to know when, um, to tell the difference between sloppiness and not a native speaker. But again, you're still going to look your best if someone else edits it for you. And Chrome is freezing, oh, there we go. And as I just said, have your proposal reviewed by someone with experience. Um, in the Drupal community alone, we have a couple of Slack channels for this. Um, we, in DrupalCon, we generally make the track chairs available for everyone. Um, I know that I always put myself out there as someone who's happy to review anybody's proposals for anything. Like, please don't send them to me the day before they're due. Um, I'll probably get a little bit annoyed with you. But in general, I'm always happy to review anyone's proposal for anything anywhere. Um, but yes, have your proposal reviewed by someone who is an experienced speaker or has served as a chair um, on an event committee somewhere um, so that they can give you their um, their feedback on it. Now, let's talk about coming up with a great title. The title is the first thing that someone's going to read. You want to think of something catchy, maybe a little bit playful, but still explanatory. Don't be too clever. Um, you want to have a title that can stand on its own without a blurb. So don't use something like CSS and elephants, unless you're going to say something like CSS and elephants, my design journey, or something that's going to explain what on earth that means. You want something that people are going to understand when they scan the conference talk titles. Even in small local events, Many people just read the title and choose what they're attending based on that alone without reading the blurb. 
Now, some people are going to be disappointed with your title no matter what happens. Uh, one of my very first talks was called Code Standards. Uh, you can be yourself, but write your code like everyone else, which I thought was just a little bit catchy, but not too much. And yet I still got a uh, piece of feedback that said, this talk was all about code standards and not about being yourself. So it was a good talk about code standards though. Uh, <laughs> so you'll never please everybody. Um, but again, try not to be, don't be too catchy. Uh, it's fine to err on the side of being a little bit boring, but just explanatory. You know, if you can't think of something that's catchy or clever, it's totally fine. Just have a title that tells us what your talk is. And then we get to the main part, creating your talk. Like writing anything, it's best to start with an outline. And like anything we write, it gets an introduction, a body, and a conclusion. So you've done the who, what, where, why, how, and when questions about your topic. With these ideas in mind, you'll create an outline for your talk. Let's start with the introduction. You want to be clear what it is you're talking about. What are you going to cover? Why does it matter? Try to pique some interest about what you're going to talk about. What is your hook? Maybe talk about, you know, give a little peek at something that you're going to talk about later. Uh, who is it aimed at? And be succinct. Don't drag out your introduction too long. And please don't apologize or insult yourself. Uh, apologize in your opening calls attention to any flaws that you might be concerned about, and it reduces the positive engagement of your audience. Um, I also really can't stand it when people say that, oh, you know, I just wrote these slides yesterday or I just wrote this talk last night. You know, people paid money generally to be at an event. Um, so even if you did just write your slides last night, don't tell the audience that might have spent $1,000 to be at this conference um, that you just treated this like a last minute homework assignment. Um, don't spend 10 minutes talking about your resume. Uh, many new speakers might talk about their hobbies or their family or their work history, um, but audiences really aren't emotionally invested in you yet. So spending a lot of time trying to convince them why they should pay attention to you is less effective than just opening with engaging content. They're already in the room. Um, you've already written a bio that they can read somewhere. So start with a relevant story. Talk about why you're giving this talk today. Tell about a story about a problem you encountered to you know, lead into a talk about how to solve similar problems. Or summarize what you're going to cover or what attendees will walk away with. Give a high level context of where each part of your talk falls into the larger topic. You know, if you're going to cover something that has discrete sections, put up a slide that says, you know, here's parts one, two, three, four, five, and what we're going to cover. You can also ask a friend to introduce you um, if you're nervous um, or if you're a new speaker, it can be better than introducing yourself and it can give you some credibility and they can also give you a little bit of praise that might kind of hype you up and hype up the audience for you a little bit. So especially maybe if you have a friend in the community who's higher profile than you, um, it might be really nice to have them introduce you, give you some credibility um, and keep, you know, it can be so awkward to introduce yourself um, and it can take some of that awkwardness out. Then we have to write the body of our talk. So, um, like I said, in the introduction, you wanna have your main topics or your headings. And then think about what the absolute main point you want to get across is in your talk. Um, and this might not come out right away. Um, everybody writes a little differently. I tend to write in a sort of, um, I don't know, I just put everything down on paper and I keep writing and writing until things kind of come out to me as main points. Um, so everyone kind of has a different process, but at some point you wanna identify the main point that you wanna get across. And then you wanna have examples or supporting points that illustrate your main point. Um, you know, just like writing an essay in school. 
and then refer to the, you know, who, what, when, where, how, and why that you use to refine your topic. And make sure you've got, you know, at least three supporting points. Um, people tend to think in um, threes or fives. So try and divide things up into nice little logical sections. So if you have three or five main subheadings, it's just kind of nice and even and it flows. And then we write the conclusion. You want to summarize what has been discussed and review the main takeaways. And then there's the so what question, you know, why does your topic matter? Um, make sure that you get that in there. Uh, give any further resources uh, or cite anything that you've used that may be useful to attendees. Um, I try to make sure that I have that on a slide or I give that um, to the attendees in, in some format. And then make sure to give the audience your contact information, whether that's an email or a Twitter handle, or if you have something like Drupal.org, you can give them that contact information. And then once you have your outline, um, you might want to go back and think about refining your title. So as a reminder, you want it to be catchy, maybe playful, but explanatory. Beware of two clever titles and make sure you have a title that can stand alone. Again, this is a great place to go look at the event um, that you're applying to, see what kind of titles they have. For example, in DrupalCon, I know we tend to love our pop culture titles. Um, so, you know, I've seen references to Harry Potter, Star Wars, Pokemon. We tend to be a little bit of a fan of those at DrupalCon. Those go over well. Um, in another community, they might not. So make sure you go and look at the kind of titles um, and abstracts that people are writing in the event that you're submitting to. Back to our speaker workshop. So now ostensibly you've got topic, a title, you're writing your abstract, you're writing your outline. So let's talk about the rest of the things you've got to do. Before we get to slides, everyone's least favorite part. And wait, there's someone who's not muted. That's me, sorry. <laughs> uh, is writing your bio. It's super awkward. No one likes writing about themselves in third person, but you have to do it. So let's get it done. Your bio, it should be in the third person. It should be a fairly short paragraph. Uh, use an economy of words. Uh, don't be too wordy. Don't, um, you know, don't make it like a huge flowery thing about yourself. You'll look weird. Uh, you want to say what you do. Where do you work? If you do any volunteer work. And as we've said for all of the other things, look at past examples from the event. It'll give you a feel uh, for what a bio should be. You can tweak it for different events. Be human. Um, try not to sound like a robot. And do talk about your non-professional interests. So uh, I will read you mine um, so you can get an idea of an example. Excuse me. Um, and this is one that I, I wrote last year after I sort of changed careers. So. After 10 years as a backend developer, Alana decided a change was in order. Still carrying a torch for Drupal, content management systems, and helping others, she is now working as a documentation writer, trainer, and developer advocate at Amazee.io. Alana also serves as a track chair for DrupalCon North America, is on the leadership team of Drupal Diversity and Inclusion, and serves the Drupal Community Working Group as an ambassador to Drupal Diversity and Inclusion. The proud owner of many pets, including several guinea pigs, she's also very involved in animal rescue. So I wanted to give a quick intro um, about my career change, uh, especially for anyone who knew me, and then talked about what I do, where I work, my volunteer work, and uh, that I love pets and do uh, animal rescue. So fairly straightforward, succinct. Um, you can also, if you're super awkward about it, make some bullet points and have someone else write it. Uh, when I was in high school and college and did theater and we had to write bios, 
uh, a lot of times that what we, that's what we would do. We would just <laughs> write all of our bullet points and swap them and then write each other's bios and then swap them back and edit them. If you really hate doing this, it's always one way to do it. But you have to have a bio. Now let's talk about becoming a better speaker. The most important thing you can do is to practice. The more you speak in front of a mirror, in front of friends, in front of a room full of people, in front of a room full of guinea pigs, the more comfortable and the better you will become. You can even give your talk to a friend over FaceTime or Skype or Zoom. As I mentioned earlier, you can video yourself and watch it back. Then you can take notes on your behaviors that you exhibit while speaking and practice reducing them. When you practice, also make sure to time yourself. Always time yourself before and well before actually giving your speech. Uh, you might be surprised by how long or short your talk is when you're speaking out loud. I know that I speak way too fast all of the time and my talks always come up shorter than I want. I have stopped worrying about this and I just hope for a good Q&A. If you're looking for opportunities to practice speaking, you could always check out Toastmasters. You can check up uh, Drupal meetups uh, on drupalcal.com. There's uh, lists, pretty much all of them, I think. And also look for small meetups in your area. Just go on meetup.com, see what's there, uh, attend them. I mean, it's a virtual world now, so there's really almost no reason not to try and check out meetups. Uh, if it's super awkward, you can just sign off. You don't even have to try and like slip out the back door without anybody noticing. So there's a lot of ways that you can go practice speaking. You can also just you know, present in front of your friends, in front of your families. Uh, one thing that I like to do to make sure that my, my session is comprehensible and understandable, even to someone who doesn't understand the topic, is I like to give my sessions, even my technical sessions, to people who aren't technical, who aren't, um, you know, my coworkers or, uh, you know, people that I know in the community, I will give, you know, I'll practice my Drupal talks in front of my mom or my best friend. And if they can get the basic understanding of what I'm saying, even without the background knowledge, then I know that I've done a good job of making a clear and understandable presentation. Some better speaker tips and here, do as I say, not as I do. Speak slowly pause, have water available and drink it. Um, especially when I am in person, I try to make sure that I have water available. Most conferences will always have it there for you. It's a good way to remind yourself to pause. I know people who write pauses and water breaks into their slides, into their speaker notes for themselves. You can go ahead and do that. Make sure to vary your voice. This isn't something that I struggle with because I come from a theater background. Uh, so public speaking and performing is natural to me, but I do find that in tech especially, a lot of presenters have a very monotone voice. Uh, and I hate to say this, but especially men. So try to be more engaged try to you know vary the tone of your voice put some excitement into it uh, and this also goes into you know looking at the whole audience or looking at the camera don't just you know look at your notes or look at your audience notes and you know make sure that you're actually giving people a reason to be engaged uh, the next one is a little bit more for in-person conferences, but, you know, keep your hands above your waist. I am always talking with my hands, but you can't really see them as much in a virtual uh, setting because they're sort of down here below the camera. But when you're speaking at a podium, you know, don't just have your hands down by your sides. At the very least, have them on the podium. Uh, if you're someone who speaks with your hands, don't be afraid to do that in a session. Remember to breathe. Uh, I try to write out my speaker notes so that they are short and, uh, you know, that there's line breaks and things that give me places to breathe. Practice without your notes. 
you don't have to give your talk without notes, but the more of it that you know without them, the better. And turn off all of your phones and notifications and uh, make sure you know about things like Gather Town being open another tab and people are randomly going to start talking and cursing and you have no idea where it's coming from. Uh, I have always have all of my notifications turned off. Uh, beware that this can sometimes work against you. The first virtual event I did was early last year and something happened with the audio and I didn't know it, but no one else could hear me uh and i couldn't hear them and then they were slacking me to tell me that there was an issue but of course i had all of my notifications turned off so i didn't know and they actually wound up having to disconnect the whole session <laughs> uh to restart it to fix the audio and also because uh i didn't have any idea what was going on but i also lived through that even though it was a little bit terrifying that the audio had gone off and a few don'ts don't drink too much coffee. Uh, you don't want to get too jittery, especially if you're already jittery from nerves. Try not to turn away from the audience or avoid the camera. Uh, this is especially in in-person events. People tend to, you know, if they're going to look at the screen behind them, they tend to turn around and now you're not looking at the audience and they're looking at your back. Be aware of using filler words like, um, we all do it a little bit try to pause instead. And again, don't read your slides or your notes directly. It's fine to reference them, but avoid reading them. Next up, handling nerves. Pretty much everyone gets nervous about public speaking. It's part of being human. It's pretty much hardwired. Keep in mind that the audience is on your side they want to see you succeed. Uh, and pretty much all of them would be nervous if they were in your shoes. It's totally okay to admit that you're nervous. People will be sympathetic. Uh, and I will admit, I think virtual conferences are even a little bit weirder uh, because you have no idea how people are responding. You don't get the uh, laughs if you tell a joke, you don't really know how things are landing. So it can be a little bit awkward. But for those of you who are afraid of speaking in front of a crowd, you no longer really have that pressure. Uh, it's weird right now because I know that I'm speaking to about 20 people, but I'm also just sitting in my office talking to myself. So <laughs> it's a little bit weird. Uh, I think the lack of feedback makes it harder, but for other people, it might make it easier. The best way to handle your nerves is practice. It really does get easier with practice. The more you practice, the better you'll know your material and the more confident you will be. Try to get some sleep. This is especially hard with in-person conferences, depending on what day your thing, your session is compared to what else is going on. I never ever go out late the night before my session. I don't care which party it is. It's not worth it to me. Exercise, if that's something that helps you uh, wind down. Um, it can help you actually burn off that nervous energy. Breathe, just breathe. Sit down and make sure you take some time to breathe before your session. Just wind down, take some time for yourself. Dress comfortably. I usually dress pretty casually at DrupalCon. Of course, this depends on the event. If you're talking virtually, there's no reason to wear anything uncomfortable. Just be comfortable with yourself. Take some time before you speak, especially with virtual events. It can be very tempting to just be working up until the time for your session. Try not to do that. Try to take some time to just unwind, do whatever helps you calm down. Know the stage or the virtual stage. If you're giving a talk in person, make sure that you actually go in the room at some time beforehand, see the stage, uh, see the podium and know what you're working with. If you're giving a virtual talk, make sure you've actually seen the platform. You know, if you haven't used Hopin or whatever is being used, make sure that you actually get a chance to get in there. Most events will have some sort of uh, chance for the speakers to get in there beforehand. Use your own devices if you can, you'll be more comfortable with them. This is one that really works for me. 
adopt a persona. If you're nervous and you don't like to go out there and talk to people, if you're an introvert, adopt a persona that is speaker you. Uh, so this is something that, that I think can be really helpful. It doesn't mean don't be yourself. It just means be the speaker version of yourself. This is something that helps me so much at events because I tend to actually be really introverted and I don't like talking to huge groups of people. I don't like having to interact with hundreds of people, but it's what we do at DrupalCon and it's important for me and for my career and usually the company I'm representing. So I am event Alana. When I go to events, I am smiling and cheerful and engaging and I like to talk to people and I talk to all the people that I can and it's not fake it's just sort of a different version of me and I can go back to my hotel room and I can turn that off when I'm at an event and it's really helpful so it's also what I do even if I'm just presenting at a virtual session I sort of um, you know, I, I put on a Drupal shirt or a team shirt and I make sure I do my hair and makeup and I'm in, you know, I'm in Alana is a speaker mode instead of just my everyday mode and it's really helpful. And be excited, you know, hype yourself up for your talk. It'll help your, you know, your energy level and the audience's energy level to be excited. Um, if no one else is marketing your talk, market it yourself. I always make sure I go on Twitter and tell people, hey, I'm speaking at such and such and doing such and such to try and make sure that, you know, someone is excited for my talk. If you're giving a virtual talk, make sure you have a quiet and uninterrupted space. Uh, I do get interrupted by my guinea pigs because they are in here, but I make sure to shut my door so that my dog isn't in here and barking and, um, you know, I tell my, my mom lives with me. So I tell her, Hey, I have this uh, event today. So don't interrupt me between these hours. And if you could keep the dog quiet, that would be great. Also make sure everything is plugged in and charged up and all of your devices are ready to go. You don't want anything to go wrong. So a lot of this is just making sure that everything is ready and you are eliminating as many problems beforehand as you possibly can. Handling Q&A discussions. This is something that scares a lot of people. First of all, the timing. Make sure you ask the organizers in advance what the expectations are so that you can time your talk and make sure that you've left room for adequate Q&A if that's something that's expected that you'll do. If the organizers haven't specified this for you, it'll generally just depend on the length of your whole session. So if you have, you know, an hour leave 10 or 15 minutes. If you only have a half hour, you're probably gonna wanna cut it down to five or tell people that you'll talk to them afterwards. If you want, you can also intersperse Q&A. Sometimes in virtual talks, this works a little bit better. Uh, in Hopin, I found that it was pretty easy for me to either have a moderator or to kind of keep an eye on the chat so I could see if there were any relevant questions that I wanted to answer as I was speaking. This doesn't work for all platforms, but it's something you can consider. Also make sure that you ask for questions. People won't generally ask them if you don't request them. If you're in a in-person conference situation, make sure that you repeat the question back to the audience. And if there's a microphone, of course, make sure that it's used so that if this is being recorded, uh, everything will be preserved. Tricky questions. Often speakers who are brand new to public speaking and even ones who aren't are super nervous about getting a question asked that they feel they don't know the answer to or that has a tricky answer. So there's a lot of ways to approach this. Admit that you don't know. Sorry, I just hit my microphone. It's totally fine. You can also say, let me look into that for you and get back to them later. Tell them you don't have that answer right now or that it's not what you're focusing on. You can throw it out to the audience. You can throw it to a friend or colleague. You might wanna check with your friends or colleagues and see if that's okay before you start the session or offer to talk about it later in the hallway or on Twitter. Oh, the smarty pants. Sometimes there's gonna be a smarty pants in the audience who thinks they know better than you 
and it can be a big fear. It doesn't happen often, but if it does, keep in mind that in these sorts of situations, other people in the audience are thinking about how big of a jerk this person is and not about how you are handling it. The best ways to handle this are to say, hey, I think we're going to have to move on now because time is running out and I really want to get a few more questions in. Uh, that can be especially useful in, this is more of a comment than a question, but, and remember, this is your talk and your stage. You can shut down the question. You can say, hey, we don't have time for this, or, oh, look, it's time and we're done, or, hey, so-and-so has another question. However you want to handle it is appropriate. It's not their talk. It, they're not on stage. You are. Uh, and unrelated questions. People will sometimes ask questions that have little or nothing to do with your talk and answering the question will derail the conversation. A good way to handle this is to say, that's a good question, but it's outside the scope of what we're talking about and I'd be happy to answer it for you privately afterwards. Uh, and sometimes there's just gonna be silence. You can give friends or colleagues questions to ask you could say, oh, here's something I didn't go into depth about in the talk, but that you might be wondering, or a question I've had come up before is, you could also ask the audience a question, or you can just wrap it up. No questions isn't always bad, and sometimes folks are happy for the extra time between sessions. I mean, we just hung out and chatted and showed our pets, and that was perfectly fine, and I don't feel like it detracted from the value of our session or our Q&A time at all. Errors. Don't be afraid to correct errors after your talk. And I think someone just said this on the chat too. If someone points out an error, either during the QRA or later, go ahead and update your presentation online and include the correction if you give the same talk again. Be sure to verify your correction uh, is actually accurate before doing this. Oh, and somehow this slide is not right. Sorry, um, the slide doesn't actually have the right content. Um, I will fix that, it, which is really ironic because this is the error slide. <laughs> See, and sometimes your slides will be wrong and life will go on. Getting post-talk feedback. Uh, we sometimes forget this part of the process, but getting feedback after your talk is really important if you want to get better at public speaking. You want to get feedback both about your content and your speaking style. So you can give friends or colleagues some Oh, why is this the same? Sorry, something happened with my slides here and it's the same content three times in a row and I know I didn't, uh, I must have done something wrong when I was doing these last couple of slides. Um, sorry. Anyway, you want feedback about whether your content was interesting, well organized, easy to follow. Um, and this is true whether you plan to ever give this same talk again. Uh, or not, because a lot of knowledge can be gained and generalized. Sometimes conferences, especially big conferences like DrupalCon, will have feedback forms that are already ready to go. Um, in those cases, I always make sure that I have those feedback forms in a slide at the end of my talk. Um, I will often ask colleagues how they thought my talk was. Um, you can also ask conference organizers if they're going to send anything out beforehand um, and ask whether you can see your own feedback. Um, the more specific your questions are, if you're asking people for feedback, the better your feedback will get. So try not to ask just, what did you think? Or was it any good? But, you know, was there something you thought could have been better? Or did you learn, you know, ask people, what did you learn? Give them, you know, a better open-ended question and not just a yes or no. Sorry, I will fix these slides before I post them. I'm really sorry about that. So now let's talk about creating great slides. Make sure to give your slides a theme. It might be that you illustrate all of your points with lolcats or they all use the same background and typography, but whatever it is, having a visually unified deck makes all of the difference. Uh, some speakers end up with a look that they stick to from presentation to presentation, and that makes their, um, their talk stand out. You might have a company deck, you might use a deck from the event. You know, sometimes I'll use a DrupalCon deck, um, but whatever it is, make sure that you have a nicely themed, attractive deck. Don't use the default slide theme. 
It really never looks original. Don't write out what you're going to be saying. This can be a flexible rule for useful and important quotes, but nobody likes someone reading lines from a slide. Don't use too small of text. Make your text size readable. Think of the person sitting at the back of the room in, again, in in-person events, uh, but also think about it in virtual events. In some virtual events, the way that the thing that things are being broadcast, it's your slides and your face. So your slides are actually not going to be as big as you think they might be. Uh, they might be half the screen because they're also casting your face on part of the screen. So make sure that you think about that. Check your contrast on a range of screens to make sure it'll be legible. Stand as far away from your computer as you can. Can you read them? If not, change it. There are also lots of contrast checkers out there that you can use to make sure that your, con that your text is not just legible to you, but officially accessible in terms of contrast. Also consider your choice of color. Again, you can check it with a contrast tool, but just because it's visible doesn't mean it's easy to read. Use readable fonts. Um, some fonts are really cool looking, but they're not readable at all. Be aware of your screen size. Again, this applies more when you're using a projector, but try to make sure that you know exactly what ratio the projector will have. Most conferences will tell you. Um, you don't want anything important being cut off. So generally try to stay away from the edges of the screen to be safe, keeping key information away from the edges. Use code sparingly. It's really hard to sit through pages and pages and pages of code on a screen. Use only what you need and make it readable. Break it up into smaller chunks if you have to. When I give my code standards talk, obviously I had to use a lot of code, but I broke it up into teeny tiny chunks. It was a lot of slides, but I didn't use giant chunks of code. Use images for humor. Also check the copyright on any images that you use. If you're using a Creative Commons graphic or something, make sure that you give the proper attribution to the creator. And a few more tips. Make sure you have a Q&A slide for the end. Practice going through your deck with an external monitor using a presentation mode so that you can go through um, your slides with notes just like you would if you were presenting. If you're presenting in person, always, always bring a backup. I back it up in every way I can think of. I save it in several different formats just in case. I put it on a couple different devices. Uh, also upload your slides somewhere before your talk just in case so that you have them. Uh, if you're presenting in person, uh, bring a presentation clicker. This can free you up to walk away from the uh, from the podium so that you're not standing there, you know, hitting your arrows or your space bar. And also, of course, proceed with caution if you want to do a live demo. Uh, I really find that it's better to video your demo and walk through it anything but doing a live demo, no matter how you think it's going to go right, it can and probably will go wrong, <laughs> which is sometimes okay if you're trying to teach and walk someone through it, but just be aware. And uh, just about on time, I think, that brings us to the end of the presentation. And so this is my official Q&A slide. And I'm going to stop sharing so that people can uh, feel free to jump in. Oh, let's see. Uh, we've got some good comments in the chat about adopting a persona. Uh, oh, yes. Talking the whole time and just saying there's no time for questions is it absolutely valid way to give a talk. You are not obliged to have a Q&A unless the event somehow enforces this. Yes, acknowledging the possibility that you could be wrong about something. Uh, errors always happen. Yes, sharing your screen, remembering that some people do have smaller screens. I wonder if there are any tips out there in terms of 
best practices for slides for virtual presentations. Um, if there are, I don't know that I've seen them. It would be something I would love uh, to know about, like what is sort of the best best practices for slides for you know a range of monitor sizes. The open dyslexic font, yes, that is a, a good one to know about. And I didn't know about white backgrounds. Uh, I do have light sensitivity because I have migraines, so I am not a fan of uh, totally white backgrounds. I also use um, night shift on everything. Everything in my, every screen in my life is as yellow as I can make it, <laughs> so. Any other comments, questions? Thoughts, things you got out of this workshop, things you didn't get out of this workshop. Oh, another tip, yeah, increasing your pointer size if referencing slide info. Um, also, if you're in person, that can be a help to having a uh, a clicker. They usually have a, you know, like a laser pointer on them. It can also depend on what slide technology you are using. If you're using Google Slides, um, I like to create my slides in Canva because they have lots of really pretty templates, but they don't have as much, they don't really have anything in terms of speaker tools. Yes, yeah, some of the pre-designed templates in Canva definitely are not accessible at all. Like I said, this one had some really cool fonts, um, but they were not at all readable. So I just tried to use the sort of idea of the theme and work with it. Anyone else feel free to chime in either in the chat or in the Zoom. And I'm always around on Twitter and in the Drupal Slack. I am in the mid camp Slack, but I just joined it today. So I can't promise I'll be in there. Sharing the link to your slides, um, that can go either or. Sometimes I like to do that so that people can follow along. Sometimes with a workshop like this, I, I don't always want to because if people just work straight through them and work ahead then I feel like they don't always get the full benefit of like paying attention while we're going through it so it, sometimes it's sort of six of one half a dozen of the other um yes avoid creating slide content at the bottom of the slide which is blocked by captions that's another one that um I would love to know if there's a sort of best practice of like how much room to leave all right thanks Alana this has been super fun yeah.